Sunday, according to the order established by our Mother of the Holy Church, we will celebrate the memory of the chorus of the holy myrrh-bearing women who came to the tomb to anoint Christ's holy body uh, after his burial. And in addition to the chorus of the myrrh-bearing women, we will also celebrate Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus, who asked for the body of Christ after the crucifixion and who buried it in a new tomb. So. In light of this celebration, the question I think obviously arises to us, why do we celebrate these two groups uh, this coming Sunday after the Sunday of Thomas? Uh, we'll celebrate, as we said, on the one hand, the chorus of the myrrh-bearing women, on the other hand, uh, St. Nicodemus and uh, St. Joseph of Arimathea. Why do we celebrate these two groups? Um, and I think the answer lies in the fact that because, just like the Holy Apostle Thomas' proclamation that Christ had truly risen uh, when he touched the risen Lord and cried out, My Lord and my God, just as this proclamation of St. Thomas uh, bore witness to the resurrection and confirmed the universal faith in the resurrection, uh, just as, as this occurred then, as so do these two groups also provide an important witness to the resurrection uh, when they're combined together. And this is indeed the answer that the Synexarian will read this Sunday during Mountains uh, gives to us. Uh, this is its answer to the question as to why we celebrate these two groups after we celebrate the Sunday of Thomas. So the Synexarian writes, uh, Joseph and Nicodemus are witnesses to the resurrection in that, uh, or, sorry, rather, Joseph and Nicodemus are witnesses that Christ truly died and was buried, and the holy myrrh bearers are witnesses to his rising from the dead, having seen the empty tomb, having heard the voice of the angel, and having met the risen Lord himself, as we heard recounted in the Gospel. Um, so when we combine these two groups together, the myrrh bearers and the, uh, the secret disciples, Nicodemus and Joseph, uh, we have yet another witness to the truth of the resurrection, as real as when Thomas proclaimed, my Lord and my God. So these two groups combined together give us another full account and witness to the truth of the resurrected Lord. Uh, now, there's indeed much more that we could say easily. Uh, the Synexarian, for example, if you read it uh, this coming Sunday, it explains why it was appropriate that Christ appeared to the women, that women received the message of the resurrection before the men or before the apostles. Um, but we're not going to go any further into this today. I'll leave that to your own reading for you to take the opportunity to read some of the Holy Service books of our church and to, uh, to read some of this important information in the Synexarian for yourselves. Rather than going further into this topic than uh, here tonight, um, we won't do this, and then neither are we going to look at the epistles or the gospels. This has been our practice over the last two years. Two years ago, we did the gospel readings in our time together, and last year we did the epistle readings. This year, we're going to do neither of those two. We're going to do something altogether different. Um, instead of these, what we're going to do, uh, of course, with God's help through the rest of this coming year, until Pascha, is that we're going to take an opportunity to look each week at the lives of uh, the saints that our church celebrates in and around the time of our talk, uh, and of course draw some conclusions from this life that we present in order to help us in our Christian struggle in today's modern world. Well, it just so happens, brothers and sisters, that today, Wednesday, we celebrate two very, very, very important saints. Uh, particularly for the Slavic Orthodox Christians. Uh, we celebrate, of course, if you've looked at your calendar, you'll know Saints Kirill and Methodius. Um, these two, the, the hymnography of our Holy Church describes as having sought out the lost coin of the Slavs and brought it to their Lord. Um, in other words, we're largely responsible for Christianizing uh, the Slavic peoples. And so it's the lives of Saints Kirill and Methodius that we're going to take an opportunity to look at uh, together tonight. So, 
St. Kirill, who is named Constantine until his monastic tonsure, and Methodius, uh, were brothers. They were born in uh, a noble family within Thessaloniki. Methodius uh, was born around 815, and St. Kirill was born in 826. Uh, the father of these two brothers was a high-ranking military officer, and this, as we've said so many uh, times before, when we talk about the lives of our saints, because they were the children of an affluent family in the Byzantine era, uh, they grew up with many advantages that others uh, didn't have, and particularly they shared in the advantage of education. They were able to be uh, taught and learn. They were able to learn freely. Methodius, on the one hand, uh, studied and became an expert in languages. Uh, particularly, he studied the Slavic languages. Uh, this worked out well to be a student of Slavic language in Thessaloniki, because Thessaloniki had a large population of Slavs during that period, and so this gave him uh, a good opportunity to learn many Slavic dialects. Um, on account of his learning, Methodius rose through the ranks of society fairly quickly, and he gained the position of Archon, which is uh, sort of a local ruler. He was made local ruler over a, a Slavic district in northern Greece, in Macedonia. Um, however, though he attained the heights uh, of civil position pretty quickly, he quickly resigned in order to become a monk, and later an abbot at a monastery on Mount Olympus. So roughly at the same time as uh, St. Methodius is ascending and then resigning in order to embrace the monastic life, something similar is going on with St. Kirill, his brother. Uh, St. Kirill, rather than studying in Thessaloniki, traveled to Constantinople for his studies, and there uh, at the famed academy in Constantinople, he was students, a student particularly under uh, the great uh, Leo the Mathematician, who was one of the great scholars of the Byzantine era, but also and particularly noteworthy, he was a student of St. Photius the Great, uh, who is universally recognized as one of the most towering uh, scholarly learned figures of the whole Byzantine period. And so he was a student of these two, Leo the Mathematician and, of course, St. Photius the Great. After the completion of his studies, uh, St. Kirill was ordained to the priesthood, and he was appointed to a high position within the Patriarchate, uh, the position of Hartophylax, uh, which is essentially the librarian for the uh, Patriarchate of Constantinople. Um, and in addition to these duties, he also became a teacher at the academy where he'd once learned, and he taught so successfully uh, that in most of the references from this period to him, He's not referred to as simply Constantine. Remember, his name is Constantine before monastic tonsure. He's rather referred to as Constantine the philosopher. So wherever you read things about St. Kirill and his life uh, before he had left for monasticism, he's always referred to as Constantine the philosopher. This is how uh, successful he was in his time uh, teaching in Constantinople. However, much like his brother, uh, Constantine, or St. Cyril, uh, quickly began to weary of this world and its distractions from the path of salvation. And so he too, within a few years, left for monasticism, uh, coming also to reside on Mount Olympus in the same monastery together with his brother Methodius. Now, Kirill's departure was not particularly well received uh, by the Byzantine emperor, who was understandably perhaps, from a worldly perspective at least, uh, quite sorry to lose someone uh, with such unique talents uh, as Kirill. And so as soon as he was informed that Kirill had left in order to take up the monastic life on Mount Olympus, he sent a search party out and uh, managed to find him at the monastery and drag him back to Constantinople, uh, from which point he began sending him out on various diplomatic missions uh, for the sake of the empire, hoping that he could use uh, St. Kirill's unique gifts in service of the empire. The first of these that we'll look at a little bit uh, was, in 18, uh, was in 851, and this diplomatic mission was to modern-day Iraq, to the Persians, in other words. Um, though when, when St. Kirill arrived uh, to speak with the Persians, their leader wanted to, as was quite the style at the time, uh, he wanted to debate religion. And Kirill, after thinking it over for a period, accepted the proposition and decided he would indeed debate, uh, debate religion with the leader and his scholars. Um, the problem was 
that St. Kirill debated so extremely well and so convincingly uh, in support of the Christian faith that the, the Persians, rather than converting to Christianity, became upset and tried to uh, poison him, tried to do away with him. Um, but Kiro was spared by some miracle of God and managed to escape their clutches and return back to Constantinople unscathed. Um, then again, a little bit later, in 860, Kiro, this time together with his uh, brother, St. Methodius, who'd now also been brought to Constantinople uh, from his uh, monastery in Olympus, were sent on a very important to a people known as the Khazars. Uh, the Khazars were a Jewish people uh, who occupied a sort of, if you, if you look at the map, we don't have one around here, but um, they occupied an area of land that acted as a sort of natural buffer between the Byzantine Empire and the newly sort of forming, or, or newly gaining strength anyway, Muslim Umayyad Empire. Um, so the Khazars were roughly in the middle between and so they acted as an important boundary between the two, the two empires. Um, the brothers, however, when they went on this diplomatic uh, mission to the Khazars in order to gain their support against the Umayyad Empire, uh, went beyond simple diplomacy in what they were doing. And they ended up preaching the gospel of Christ to the Khazar leader. And in the end, he, together with his whole people, embraced Christianity and uh, therefore ended up developing very strong ties to Byzantium. Uh, so their mission was a success on a spiritual level in that unexpectedly the two brothers were able to convert the Khazars to Christianity, uh, but it was also a political diplomatic success in that he managed to gain their affections uh, for the sake of the Byzantines in uh, helping to secure this boundary between the Byzantine Empire and the, uh, the Muslims. But these two, the two we've just talked about, these two uh, diplomatic sort of missions that Saints Kirill and Methodius were sent upon, uh, really pale in comparison to one. They're, they're, they're really nothing when we compare it to their major accomplishment, uh, which is their most significant uh, journey of their lives. Uh, this time, when they went out, it was purely missionary in character, what they were doing. Um, and their journey, uh, this this journey, uh, like we said, was purely missionary in character, and it wound up being obviously their most successful and most renowned uh, missionary labor, and this is their uh, mission to Moravia. Uh, Moravia, in modern terms, if we were to look at a map today, occupies parts of the Czech Republic, uh, Slovakia, Austria, and Hungary, and uh, most notably, this is an area that was populated uh, by people who were Slavic by race. So this is the first mission uh, of the Holy Church to the Slavic peoples, um, and therefore something very significant. Now what had happened, is a little bit of background, before this journey, this missionary journey undertaken by St. Kirill and Methodius, uh, the king of the Slavs, Saint, uh, later St. Rostislav, uh, had converted his people to Christianity. But sorrowing, after he'd made this conversion, he wrote a letter uh, to the emperor, Byzantine emperor Michael III, saying, Though our people have rejected paganism and have embraced Christ, we do not yet have a teacher who can explain to us in our own language the true Christian faith. And then he concludes uh, with a petition to the emperor Michael, asking him to send them such a teacher in order that they might learn their faith truly. Um, that's a wonderful thing in and it of itself, to convert it and to recognize that they still needed to be built up in the Christian faith uh, and to learn things about it and therefore that they needed a teacher of quality to come to them and do this for them. So after getting this letter, the Emperor Michael turns and begins to consult with uh, the now patriarch, St. Photius the Great, uh, concerning all of this and who they should indeed send. And in the end, the Emperor Michael III accepts St. Photius' suggestion that the best fit for this mission to the Slavs was going to be uh, the brothers from Thessaloniki, St. Kirill and Methodius, who had enjoyed such a uh, success in their relations with other, pe other peoples to this point. And so with St. Photius' and, uh, Photius blessing and the Emperor Michael's endorsement, uh, the two brothers left for this land of Moravia, the Slavs, in 863. And they did a lot. They did a great, uh, great amount of things in their first period of time there. First, and perhaps most notably, uh, they created a written alphabet. 
The Slavs uh, were to some extent a nomadic people in their history, and they had never developed a written form of their alphabet. It was only a spoken language. Um, and so the first thing Saints Kirill and Methodius did with all their great learning was to develop an alphabet, which is today known as Cyrillic. They still use the same alphabet today. And basically what they did is they used a lot of Greek letters um, and added some new letters borrowed from other languages in order to uh, compensate for some of the sounds that the Slavic language has that the Greek language doesn't. Um, this is a pretty major accomplishment to have invented or to be credited with inventing a language, a written language for people who had none previously. So this was their first task they said about was to develop this written language. Second, using this written language that the two had developed together, um, they translated the most important books, the most important books of the church in written form into this language. Um, so first they did the Gospels, and then the Acts, and then the Psalter, and then the Octoikos, or the Book of the Eight Tones, which is used at all the daily services uh, throughout the church uh, throughout the day, and then the Divine Liturgy. Um, now this, I have to tell you, it, no doubt it seems like a lot, but this is a major, major accomplishment. Uh, just to put it in a little bit of perspective, um, I've done a little bit of translating work myself. The last project was probably about maybe 300 pages or something like that, and it took about six years. These two brothers, in a very short period of time, number one, developed a written form of language for people who had none, and then translated all of these Greek books into that language in, in no time. I mean, I think we should look at that, at the, the size of that accomplishment, and just understand the extent to which God was working together with them, um, because that is virtually an impossible task, and yet they did it uh, in their time in Moravia. So with all these books now translated um, and their written language to convey what they wanted to, uh, things went very well in the mission to the Slavs at first. Um, this is, of course, up to the point that they first met with the Germanic or Frankish missionaries. Um, these are what we would call the future Roman Catholics. They aren't Roman Catholic yet. Uh, Roman Catholicism doesn't exist as a heresy at this point. Um, but they're a set of Christians who have adopted beliefs that are no longer orthodox, that also came to missionize the same territory that the orthodox were missionizing uh, in the form of the mission of St. Kirill and Methodius. So this becomes a major snag in the, in the mission process. Um, in a little bit of historical background, uh, while the East and West did not have a lot uh, to do with each other in this sort of particular period of time, they didn't have a lot of interaction. Their interactions before this had always been very jovial and very brotherly and, and very easy uh, because even though they were separated by a great distance, the Western Christians possessed the same faith as they did and used roughly the same liturgies. And so when they met together, they never had a problem. This time, however, when St. Kirill and St. Methodius uh, met these Frankish missionaries coming from the West, uh, the future Roman Catholic missionaries, uh, they started noticing some very troubling things. Um, for example, one of the things they noticed was that these new missionaries were making the sign of the cross backwards. Whenever they had met Western Christians previous to this, uh, they made their sign of the cross as Orthodox do, the same way we do today. But all of a sudden, there was these people coming from the West who were doing something different than what Western Orthodox Christians had done. In addition, beyond this, when they served uh, the divine services, when they offered divine liturgy, they had stopped using leavened, uh, leavened bread and were only using unleavened bread. So this was another very noticeable, uh, strange thing that had developed. In addition to that, and perhaps most troubling, most obviously troubling, when they recited the creed, the creed that had been recited commonly by Christianity for its entire history, they added words that were never there in the ecumenical councils. So when it came to the discussion of the, uh, the procession of the Holy Spirit from the Father, these missionaries started adding the words proceeded from the Father and the Son, what's called the filioque clause. Uh, the ecumenical councils very clearly taught that it was not, it was impossible for someone to change the creed, even an iota, but yet these missionaries coming from the West uh, that had always been brethren to the Orthodox, had been Orthodox themselves, were all of a sudden adding words to the creed. So these were very troubling 
very troubling developments uh, that they had sort of run headlong into. Um, but also very bothersome on a very practical level, perhaps not as important as the issues that had developed surrounding the faith, also very bothersome was the insistence of these uh, Frankish missionaries that all missionary efforts, including the celebration of services, be conducted only in Latin or in Greek or in Hebrew and no other language whatsoever. Um, and their argument was these were the three languages that were found on the placard that was put on uh, the cross by Pontius Pilate. And therefore, the Latin argument now was that only these three could be used for religious things. And so they were in the process of trying to Latinize uh, the people they were coming into contact with, preaching to them in Latin and those kinds of things, uh, instead of trying to embrace their own, uh, use their own language as Kirill and Methodius were. And when uh, the missionaries got together and started arguing about these things, uh, St. Kirill very wisely, wisely uh, quoted the words of St. Paul saying, that every tongue should confess uh, that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. In other words, that every language should be able to praise Christ as Lord. Uh, and then he said, "Is it better not to follow Saint Paul than to follow the example of Pilate?" But nonetheless, uh, Saint Kirill's arguments did nothing to these missionaries, um, and it ended up causing a complete sort of mix-up in the mission area. Understandably, these new Christians were very confused by the fact that they were having the Orthodox come to them and teach them one thing, and all of a sudden having these other missionaries come from the West teaching them something different. Um, so they were teaching them new elements of the faith, new practices, um, and also these two groups weren't cooperating one with another. Um, so this was indeed a very troubling situation. Um, it's important to note in passing that this context, this, the mission to the Slavs, is really the first indication of just how badly things were going in the West during this period. Um, that the West, in the other words, was at this point on the verge of losing and forfeiting orthodoxy. Um, and so it's it, within the context of this mission that this becomes clear. And then in, in continuation, uh, St. Photius ends up calling the, the Eighth Ecumenical Council in order to start dealing with some of these problems. Now, at this point, however, well, there was this clear, uh, what we might call sort of proto-Catholic, Roman Catholic Church developing. Um, the papacy during this period, the office of the Pope, is going back and forth. It's oscillating. Uh, one Pope would be Orthodox, and the next Pope would be sort of Frankish. And it was going back and forth like this for a few years during this period. Um, so one Pope would be entirely Orthodox in his mindset. He would defend... Uh, you know, the use of other languages uh, wouldn't allow the filioque, only uh, leavened bread of the liturgy, those kinds of things. Then the next one would come along and he would try to instill these sort of uh, heretical new ideas. Um, at the time, during the initial years of St. Kirill Methodius' mission, uh, the Pope was sympathetic to the Franks. He was Frankish, uh, pre-Catholic, we might say. Um, so the Germanic missionaries appealed to the Pope, and uh, who was Nicholas, and because he was on their side, he immediately issued a writ recalling Kirill and Methodius to Rome in order that he could try them for their, uh, their so-called wronging of the, the other missionaries. Um, and so he recalled them to Rome in 867. Um, and because the schism, the official breach, had not yet happened, there hadn't been a council that condemned what the Frankish missionaries were doing as heretical, uh, or the beliefs that they were holding as heretical, uh, Kirill and Methodius respected the summons of the Pope, and they left the mission field in order to go to Rome in order to face trial uh, for what was going on. Um, upon their arrival, however, once they arrived in Rome, it was discovered that uh, Nicholas, the previous Pope, had proposed and he'd been replaced by Hadrian III, who is now Orthodox. And so when Hadrian met the, the brothers, he was completely smitten with them. He received them as heroes uh, for standing up for the faith, and particularly uh, for teaching the people in their own language and not insisting on the use of Latin uh, in the mission field. And so he even asked them to celebrate the Divine Liturgy in Slavonic in a couple of churches in Rome uh, in order to show people what was going on uh, in the mission field. 
Um, here in Rome in 869, Hero falls ill and he reposes and he was buried in the church of St. Clement uh, in Rome where his relics remain to this very day. So this leaves St. Methodius then alone. Uh, St. Methodius, after his brother's repose, again returns to the Slavic mission um, after the Pope had ordained him as a bishop as a sort of seal to show the authority of his ministry so that hopefully when he went back he wouldn't uh, receive any trouble. Uh, however, the Germanic missionaries captured him on his way back to the mission and uh, despite the fact that they no longer had a Pope who was sympathetic to him, uh, they imprisoned St. Methodius for three full years and drug him around from place to place, leaving him sort of uh, uncovered in the rain and those kinds of things in order to sort of torment him. So they kept him captive for three full years. And when he was finally released, understandably, uh, St. Methodius left the mission field for a period, went back to Constantinople, uh, where he received great encouragement from St. Photius the Great, uh, and he returned to the mission field yet again, and there will he, uh, in his last years, he translates the rest of the scriptures, as far as we know, everything except the book of Maccabees into Slavonic. Uh, and also importantly, he appoints a successor, a new bishop to follow after him. And he doesn't, importantly, he doesn't choose uh, a bishop from Constantinople to come and, and take uh, on after him. Rather, he ordains a native Moravian, a native Slav, and appoints him to become bishop uh, as his successor. Uh, and St. Methodius then, after appointing his successor, reposes in 855. So we've said a lot. We've said a lot of things there. Um, but I think there's some important points from the lives of St. Kirill and Methodius uh, that we want to highlight and uh, bear, I think, towards the front of our minds uh, as we go away from this. The first thing I think we want to take very seriously, and it's something that comes up over and over again uh, in the lives of the saints and many of the saints we've talked about together in the past couple of years, is just the great value uh, that these saints placed on the kingdom of God and salvation above every other earthly office or concern. As we said, both of these brothers from Thessaloniki came from a family where they enjoyed the advantages of wealth. Uh, they were from noble, a noble family. Uh, you know, with every advantage. They both ascended very quickly in, in sort of civil status. Methodius was a, became a sort of local ruler. Uh, St. Kirill became a professor in Hartel Felix and all these high offices. Yet when it came to the question of salvation, uh, they were both very quick to abandon all of these things, to cut complete ties with them and give themselves over fully uh, to the work of saving their souls and to embrace monasticism. And so I think that's the first lesson from their lives for us, is just how emphatic we have to be and how much weight we have to put on this question of our salvation and how willingly we have to be uh, to abandon all things that stand in the way of this uh, in following their example. The second point, which is also important, I think particularly in our day because we get confused about these things a lot, is that unequivocally when we look back at the tradition of our church, the best missionaries are always those who live a high level and intense spiritual life, usually the monastics. Um, we're spinning our tires if we are not holding, we're hoping to do mission work. Um, just sort of maybe spending our time at university studying missiology or something like that. This is silliness, it does not work. It's, it's unequivocally evident from our holy tradition that the best missionaries are holy people. And we see this yet again in the examples of St. Kirill and Methodius. Where did the best, the Katexohim, we might say, the missionaries par excellence of our church come? They in fact came from, the, from monasteries uh, and they were people who lived a very intense spiritual life. So that's the second point. Uh, the third point, another very important point, because this is also something that gets confused a lot in our, in our modern day. When we do missionary work, we indeed are supposed to embrace the culture surrounding us in as many ways as we possibly can. For example, language. Language is an area where we can embrace the culture that surrounds us. But faith and the way of life that is taught has to remain absolutely the same. Those are not areas where we adapt to the culture surrounding us when we do missionary work. 
We make adaptation in the area of language, the way we speak, those kinds of things. But in the faith we teach and in the practice we preach, we do not alter a single thing in order to make the gospel more acceptable uh, to others. Kirill and Methodius, on the one hand, are good examples for us because on the one hand, they fought ardently to use the Kyrillic, uh, to use the Slavic languages in their interactions with the Slavic peoples. On the other hand, they fought equally hard in order to protect the faith, to keep the faith pure, and to ensure that the practice of the gospel was preached to the Slavic people as it had always been preached and not altered uh, somehow. And so these are the three points uh, I would leave us uh, with tonight. And I would uh, suggest that we all pray fervently to both Saints Kirill and Methodius because we in Canada live in a missionary territory, whether we want to think of it that way or not. Um, the Orthodox Church in North America and the Diaspora is a missionary church. We're here to baptize the Western world, restore to baptism the Western world as it's fallen away. Um, and to bring it to orthodoxy. And so uh, we're constantly undertaking this task of missionizing, and therefore if we're going to be doing this, we need to be looking at the examples, uh, the holy, successful examples of mission that have preceded us in the life of the church, and there are no more, uh, there are no more successful examples of this than Saints Kirill and Saints Method and St. Saint Methodius. So that's as much as I'm going to say tonight. I went over my time a little bit. Um, but if we have any questions that we want to talk about from here uh, on particular points, I think we can open it up to that. Hello, Father. Christos Anesti. Hi, Christos Anesti. Um, I have a question about your part of the world. Uh, I know there's some Moravian uh, missions on the Labrador coast. So are they, did they become Orthodox or did, did, they, or did they stay Orthodox or did they, they become Latinized? Which? Mor Moravia doesn't really ex doesn't exist as a territory anymore. No, but but there are uh, or there used to be Moravian missions on the on the Labrador coast. Oh yeah, I don't I don't know anything about it. Oh okay, I didn't. Yeah, I, I don't know. Uh, I can look into it and see. So do do you think they became Latinized? It, Moravia kind of got swallowed up, didn't it? My guess would my guess would be. Okay. But that's just a guess. But I'll look in and see if I can find anything. It'd be neat if they were Orthodox, but I don't know. <laughs> yeah, I, I feel not. I don't think they're there anymore. <laughs> yeah. Well, you. I'll look into it and let you know if we find anything out. Thank you. Is, is the mic working, Father? Uh, I just broke up a little bit right there. Can you hear me? Yeah, now I can. Christos Anesti, Father. Christos Anesti. Um, I read two scripture verses for the gospel reading for this Sunday, and I, I guess I just wanted you to uh, explain a couple things for, uh, to them. Um, do we have anything, though, before we do that, do we have anything particularly about uh, St. Carol and Methodius, sort of we're connected to mission stuff before we go on to, to other things? If we don't, that's fine. We'll, we'll go with that, but uh, I just want to make sure we don't uh, get off onto something else. Christ is risen. Really is um, it? It's very interesting uh, touching on the subject of uh, missionary work. I'm just curious what your opinion would be on the current status of ethnic Orthodox parishes, either either in your part of the world or in North America in general. Mm -hmm. uh, particularly particularly here in Canada, the majority of us, I guess here being Greek. Um, we are seeing this great generational gap between the younger generations, which don't speak Greek, yeah. and the elderly, which do. So there's kind of this scale that, that many priests and our clergy are trying to balance between pleasing those sure. that, are, that are native Greeks and, and the newer people, the younger people. Yeah, yeah. Uh, what do you foresee... Um, possibly in the years to come, in the decades to come, um, between this great kind of gap. Um, yeah. Are a lot of these ethnic parishes eventually going to become more uh, missionary-minded, as in, 
even outreaching to uh, people that are not part of their ethnic group? Yeah, yeah, um, that's a good question. Um, it's a complex question in a certain way. Um, because on the one hand, yeah, I think you pointed out one phenomenon, which is the fact that um, in a lot of the ethnic churches, there's a lessening in terms of the population that understands the language that the services are being served in. Um, so, for example, a lot of the Greek parishes now, you have um, you know Greek people who don't understand Greek uh, particularly well or at all in some cases, and that number is just getting larger and larger. Um, with the Slavic parishes, something... Well, and you know what? It may happen with the Greek parishes in the end, too. Um, there is also a phenomenon, though, of new immigration. Um, it's particularly strong in the Slavic churches in that there are waves of Slavs still coming over. And so there's still obviously a need uh, for sort of functioning ethnic parishes, so to speak, that are, that are serving the needs of the, the immigrant populations uh, that maybe in some cases don't speak any English yet or very little English. Um, and so there is an importance, I think, especially in big city circumstances where you have multiple churches, uh, for there to be situations where those people can go and, and uh, be consoled and helped uh, in, in the difficulties they're experiencing through immigration and things like that. Um, I think where it becomes a bit more of a difficult situation is in smaller places where there is maybe perhaps only one church. Um, I look at the example, well, I mean, we're an example. I, I'm the Orthodox priest of a church that where there's only one on an entire island. Uh, you know, at almost the same size as Greece. There's one Orthodox church, one parish. Um, so the language question for us became something we had to look at very seriously very early. And the way we essentially dealt with it was to come to the conclusion that we were going to do absolutely everything in English um, with occasional instances where uh, we would incorporate some other languages. For example, um, we have some nights where this, the only people who come to service, service are Russian. And so in those cases, when the chanter looks back and sees it's an entirely Slavic congregation, he will start singing some hymns in Slavonic. But generally, if we have any mix at all, we keep everything in English. And that's just because you know, we exist in a situation where we have uh, Arabs uh, you know, from the Patriarchate of Alexandria. We have uh, uh, Ukrainian, Russian, uh, Greek, uh, Serbian. You name it, we have it. Uh, and so the only common denominator language for us is English. Um, and so that, that's been the way we've solved the issue in sort of this situation where we exist in a city where there's only one, or you know, an, a whole province where there's only one church. Um, the only way to approach uh, our responsibilities with regard to our mission to the world as well as to the people here is to serve in English. Um, like I said, it becomes more complicated in, in situations in big cities. Uh, and also where you have large immigrant populations still coming in. Um, there, I think that question gets a little bit more complicated in terms of what needs to be done. Um, there, we're being, uh, in a big city like that, it can be a missionary endeavor to have you know, a, a Russian parish or a Greek parish that's serving people who are honestly Greek or honestly Russian. Um, but I think in a lot of cases, the the way we would like to see things go, I think, with the passage of time, uh, the natural way for it to go a little bit, I think, would be for the language to shift in some places where it can towards the language of the, the land where we are. And that will serve uh, as sort of part of our missionary efforts. So the, I mean, the answer is, for the time being, there's probably no immediate change uh, that's going to happen with regard to that. Will it be something that will probably adjust with time? Probably. Probably you'll see it will adjust, um, but for now there is actually there is some necessity for for quote unquote ethnic parishes that's uh, still at this stage. Oh, we lost the microphone. Thank you. Now that was a well balanced answer. Okay, Father, I I guess um. If you want, I can ask a question about uh, yeah, sure, go ahead. missionary work, if you want. Or... Well, whichever, if you've got something involving those things, maybe it's, we'll, we'll do those first, and then if we have time, we'll come back to other stuff. Okay. 
Okay. Um, uh, my question is, I guess, okay, with in modern times now with missionary work, we have a lot of different ways that people do missionary work. For example, um, you know, we have the monastic movement where they have their own way of, uh, of uh, bringing people towards the church. And then, um, unfortunately, you have the ecumenical movement. And you have, you know, this clash between um, traditionalism and ecumenism or whatever. Um, can, can you clarify? <laughs> uh, the reason I ask is because in this upcoming so-called synod, in June, they have this document, the relations, uh, yeah, the Orthodox with the um, with the non-Orthodox, and there's some confusion. You know, when I ask certain people about certain things, you know, with joint prayers and all that stuff, and they say to me, "Oh, well, we're doing missionary work. We're preaching the good news." You know, no. so could you clarify? Because there's a lot of confusion. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. I think, first of all, the first thing I would have to say, and I've said this before, I remember saying in Greece once when we were, we were uh, in a talk somewhere, ecumenism in its modern form is actually anti-missionary uh, in every way, shape, and form. That might seem somewhat counterintuitive because typically we see it as a way of sort of reaching out and those kinds of things. Um, the problem is that the theological presuppositions of ecumenism uh, generally believe that there's no such thing as the one holy Catholic and apostolic church, and that they don't believe that that is the orthodox church. Therefore, the way they're going to treat people they're reaching out to uh, is going to be very different than the way they ought to. For example, when, when the church believes itself to be the one holy Catholic and apostolic church, when it relates to Christians of other denominations, it relates to them with the desire of bringing them to oneness within the within the Orthodox Church. Very clearly, that's the that's the task of of uh, missionary work from an Orthodox perspective is unity with the Orthodox Church. Uh, ecumenism, when it acknowledges various levels of ecclesiology within other denominations, um, loses sight completely of that, and therefore has no motivation to do missionary work whatsoever because ultimately it believes that everyone is fine where they are. Um, so that's, that's on one fundamental level, that's why I would say that ecumenism is actually anti-missionary, because it removes a lot of the impetus for missionary work in an important area, which are those Christians who are already well disposed towards Christ and the gospel. I mean, those are the, I mean, those are the people we should feel the most sympathy towards and the most desire to bring to the church, are these people who in their hearts hide a, 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 a true desire for Christ and his gospel, but yet within the ecumenical movement, we've cut all those people off from our missionary activity. We don't pay any missionary attention to them whatsoever. And so therefore, from the, uh, the perspective of ecumenism, uh, it's anti-missionary. It's the exact opposite of what we're supposed to be doing, because it leaves people where they are. Um, with regard to the, the argument of, of joint prayer, um, there's an excellent book by uh, Father uh, Anastasius Gopsopoulos. He wrote it a few years ago called uh, Simplosity Me Eret Kus no Miso. I don't remember. Um, but you probably have it at the bookstore. Uh, but it's a, an excellent study where he goes through canon not only canonically, but also in the writings of the modern fathers from St. Photius onward up to St. Nectarios, sort of showing that unilaterally the saints do not condone joint prayer in, in, uh, in any circumstance. Why wouldn't we do that? As, as was pointed out, one of, this is usually one of the things they jump on, saying, oh, well, this is, just, this is an opportunity for us to get along or to reach out or to, to do things together. The fathers don't think of it that way. The holy fathers think, what is going to confuse someone and remove their zeal uh, and destroy their zeal in seeking for truth. And when we take expressions of unity, 
prayer, like the common celebration of the liturgy and things like that, and we serve them and we, we pray with people uh, whom we are not united with, it leads them to believe that we are united to a degree we are not united, and therefore again leaves them in their delusions and heresies. And so, from the father's perspective, the uh, the the strict uh, I can't even think of English words. The strict sort of prohibition against joint prayer is missionary, because by denying joint prayer, by not participating in that. We're showing the non Orthodox that on some level we aren't the same. And therefore you need to seek after truth. When we do all the things that are outward signs of unity with people we aren't united to, all it does is take away their impetus for seeking after truth. And we end up leaving them where they are thinking they're perfectly fine. Again, that's anti-missionary. That destroys our mission. It, so, it yes. Um, Father, um, if I could just kind of bring up, bring up, keep hearing myself echo. <laughs> That's alright, I can hear you clearly, so. Um, it, kind of something I think that a lot of us have experienced is the is with mixed marriages. Um, and, you know, a lot of us have family some being converts or some not being converts like me myself I, I was born I was born orthodox but there's a lot of within within my own family I have cousins I have uncles I have aunts in intermarriages with non-orthodox and um, you know it's very difficult sometimes to to balance some um, be trying to remain traditional and uh, and trying to explain to them at the same time why we can't go to their services, why we can't, yeah. you know, do certain things. You know, it comes off, you know, with with the all these human rights codes now, yeah. they they start throwing things like, oh, you're being discriminating, you're being anti-Christian, anti-loving, social justice, which actually Christ doesn't even doesn't even really condone these things, you know. Um, you know, could you talk, could you say something about that, you know, you know, like for example, if I have a family member that passes away, yeah, and they happen to be Anglican or, or even atheist, let's say, and the family's telling me, oh, well, why don't you just go, you believe Orthodox in your heart, you know, uh, going there, you're not compromising the faith, you're just going there to show support, how do you explain to them, listen, I love this person. I care for this person. I will pray for this person. I will even go to their to their grave site, just not, you know, participating in certain things that might end up influencing me, in, in, or might even end up making people think that. I, I don't know if you get what I'm saying. But, yeah. No. No. I understand. You know. And, um, it's a bit of a difficult question in some in some sense because they're. As it's been presented to me, in some there is a bit of latitude in some circumstances. Um, so it may be within the realm of a spiritual father to not sort of harshly uh, deal with a situation where someone maybe attends a a non-orthodox service for the sake of a, you know a relative or something like that, um, giving them, of course, maybe the prohibition that they're not going to pray while they're there. They're simply there to be visual. They stay in the back of the church. You know, they don't redo readings. They don't do any of that stuff. Um, there seems to be an argument, anyway, uh, from the canonical perspective, uh, in which that might be acceptable for a spiritual father to grant an economy in that case, so long as the person knows that they're not going to participate and that they're, you know, going to basically take their prayer rope and only be seen there, uh, but spiritually not be present in any in any circumstance. Um, so there may be an argument for that. So I'm not gonna I'm not gonna sort of go uh, too far with that because from what I've read, there may possibly be some latitude for those sort of uh, circumstances. Um, 
That's a lot. I mean, apart from that, but beyond saying something else in that vein, that's a lot different than, than the ecumenism we're talking about. You know, people that, that uh, maybe go to something like that because they feel pressure from family or something like that. That's a lot different than ecumenism where the goal is purely to, to demonstrate the unity of these two bodies. Um, so therefore, I think because the effect is somehow lessened, uh, the statement is lessened as a result of the of what's going on. There may be some sort of possible room for latitude. So I don't I don't want to go in because I don't want to step on on toes of, of spiritual fathers who may be correct in in granting economy in certain circumstances. Um, those are sort of pastoral things that need to be dealt with one spiritual father. Um, but generally, canonically, you know, the the position is clear. Now, uh, sorry, Father. Now on the question of um. Um, some th so-called some theologians and metropolitans and patriarchs making statements like the divided church theology, yeah, or misinterpretations of the Gospel of John, John chapter seventeen, uh, where Christ prays uh, for the unity, which actually Father Romanides explains that it has nothing to do with the unity of Christian denominations together. Yeah. You know, but they they take it and you know there's the they, well, the petitions and the litany. These people will misinterpret everything. Um, we have to we have to be willing to sort of look deeper into things than simply making self-serving. Uh, I shouldn't say that it's not necessarily self-serving, uh, but we sometimes have to we have to be aware that we can interpret the the gospel according to our own desires. Sometimes we have to be very careful with that. I think that's what goes on sometimes. We see all these things, but uh, if we read the fathers on any of those topics, on any of those passages, you know, if we look at the commentaries on the Litany of Peace, if we look at John's Gospel, um, none of the fathers envision that as applying to denominationalism. But I think that's that's the most important point. The most important thing is, I think, generally on the the ecumenical front, ecumenism to a, a large segment of the population becomes anti-missionary because it destroys the impetus for the seeking of truth. It creates the illusion of truth, and therefore leaves a whole swath of people who who we should be wishing to enjoy the fullness of life in Christ and keeps them on the side because at least it lets them believe that they're fine where they are. Sorry, did someone else have a question? Um, I have a question. I actually have a, a question on interfaith marriages as well. Um, forgive me, I'm very, very bad at quoting the Bible, but I'm paraphrasing here. Uh, the Bible says if a, if a man marries an unbeliever, it's his job to make her an unbeliever, and if a woman marries an unbeliever, it's her job to make him a believer is like is this is this ringing a bell in your head? Yeah. yeah. Okay. So is 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 um so is what the Orthodox Church doing okay then when when an Orthodox yeah. marries a non-Orthodox is that what that means like with it's it's okay yeah. with the hopes of the Orthodox person bringing the other person around? Yeah. No, it's not. It's not the same thing. Um, basically, those situations, if you look at the commentaries, uh, the Father's commentaries on them, they're talking about people uh, who converted to Christianity and were married already. And so it's a completely different situation. Sometimes those things get applied to the, the modern situation, um, but it's pretty clear from the patristic commentaries that they're not talking about those situations. They're talking about people who were married uh, prior to their conversion to Christ and how they're supposed to relate uh, to their spouse now that they're Christian, and the spouse maybe hasn't become Christian. Okay, so then every single time a priest performs an marriage, they're doing something wrong? I'm not saying anything about what the priests are doing. Um, let everyone do his own conscience and be informed in what he's doing. There's lots of books on mixed marriage, um, particularly the one by, by Christos Libanos is very good. Um, he describes very accurately and uh, from the perspective of our tradition what, how we view this, this practice. Um, but yeah, I think one of, 
it's a very it's a very delicate situation simply because we have so much of it around. We have to be very careful how we speak about it. Yeah, that's it. And, I mean, the hope is the hope is that look, God can take God can take even difficult circumstances uh, and and turn them into good things. Um, we we aren't condoning sort of missionary dating where people sort of you know, marry in the hopes of somehow later bringing their spouse along or something. But, you know, there's a hope maybe that, that if it's happened already, um, maybe the spouse will someday become orthodox if, 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 if it works the right way. Um, so that's what we can pray for in those situations. We can pray that, that okay, what's done is done, um, but now we have to pray that, that God illumine the spouse who's not orthodox to become orthodox uh, and, uh, and make their life uh, full. Okay, thank you. If I can just ask another quick question. Sure. Um, I have a question about us attending mysteries at the Macedonian Orthodox Church. Is it okay for us to attend because it's not an issue of faith? Until they're, until they're reconciled, we shouldn't. Okay, thank you. It's unfortunate. It's a schism. It's a it's a schism, and hopefully, you know, we pray uh, God will will put His hand to it, and, and the schism will be healed. Um, but but until the schism is healed, we, we shouldn't be participating in schismatic bodies. Um, hello, Father. It's me again. Sure. Um, I was raised non-Christian, and my family is basically a mosaic of schismatic organizations. So anytime there was anything going on in our family, there was always people outside the church while the service was going on or at the coffee shop across the street. But as soon as the reception was on, yes. And if it was a funeral, you'd show up at their house with a casserole. That's it, exactly. And, and that was how we dealt with it. And, exactly. And you can do wonderful things that way. Yeah. Um, People remember those gestures, you know. Especially like nowadays, the big thing in a lot of situations is uh, they're not having like a funeral mass or a funeral, but they'll have like a wake or something beforehand. Well, that's an ideal situation because you can go and you can actually speak to them. My and, my favorite thing was to either go chop wood because people always need wood for the winter, or yeah. go go wash dishes because people are busy with stuff. And just, you know, whatever whatever you can do to help there, just be there. That's it. That's it. There's, that's you very. You have to go in the church. <laughs> no, that's that's excellent for you to point out because that's important. We can find ways of sort of making that situation doable, um, if if we really look hard enough. Thank you, brother. But th thank you for saying that. That was that was good to recall. But. Hey, Father, uh, I keep throwing all these questions at you. Um, I have, I'm going to try to make these two questions very, very brief. Okay, the first question is, and I think Father Anastasios Kotsopoulos, is that how you say his name? Yeah, Kotsopoulos, yeah. Um, if you can briefly comment on, um, um, with with respect to how converts are received, you know, economia versus acrivia, um, because there's a lot of confusion with that. Hmm? <laughs> okay. All right. Forget that question then. <laughs> I mean, look, look. It's another question uh, without me going into it in perfect detail. Um, most of you know me already. You know my positions on these things. The books are there for us to fill out our minds and any questions we have. Uh, Father Father George Mitalinos, uh, Mitalinos has written a wonderful book called I Confess One Baptism. He explains exceedingly clearly from a canonical perspective uh, where the Orthodox Church stands on using baptism as a means of, of uh, reception uh, in the modern world. Particularly good now has also uh, uh, come out Father Peter Heer's book on, uh, on the Ecclesiology of Vatican II where he explains exceedingly clearly uh, where we stand with respect to the, the Catholic view of baptism, which has developed in the modern period. If you read those two books, there is nothing else I can say to you on that topic because uh, those two books cover virtually everything one could want to say about it. Okay, last question then. 
un, unrelated to this. Yeah, I recommend that you read those books. As Orthodox Christians, it's very good for us to know those things. Uh, so read those two books, Father George Mitchell and I Confess on Baptism, and Father Peter's book on uh, the Ecclesiology of Vatican II. Okay. Um, okay, if you can't answer this question, this last question, I understand, Father. Please forgive me for this question. Um, could you explain the um, the role of the ecumenical patriarch in relation to other autocephalous churches in, in terms of like when he's allowed to intervene and when he's permitted not to intervene. Sure. And, and if he's supposedly if he has more authority than all the other patriarchs, like if all the other patriarchs are supposedly subordinate to him, you know. The only, I mean, the, the role of any of the, a bishop is a bishop is a bishop. That's the most important thing to understand. A bishop is a bishop is a bishop. It doesn't matter what title you hold, you're still the bishop of a local diocese. That's, that's your task. Um, for administrative purposes, we raise certain bishops above other bishops. Um, so, for example, uh, you know, you have archbishop and then patriarch, let's say. Um, if an archbishop goes wonky, you need a place to appeal if he's doing things that are weird or something like that comes up. So you have the office of patriarch in order to appeal and sort of hopefully have him intervene in a fatherly manner and sort of help rectify the situation through consultation with the other bishops. So. The other function is administrative also in the sense that when you have councils, the notion is that a patriarch would preside at the council, meaning you chair the council. The chair of a meeting, if you've been in a properly run meeting before, the chair doesn't, doesn't Shanghai the meeting. It's not his job to set every, the agenda, to make all the decisions and just force everyone to agree with them. That's not what a good chair does. A good chair just ensures everybody is acting respectfully and that we're following the rules of uh, the procedural rules. That's his job. That's what a patriarch does. A patriarch is there in the, in the case that uh, something has gone wrong below him and he needs to intervene uh, for administrative reasons, because usually because he's been asked by someone else to come in and look at a situation. Um, and then he will deal with it in council not by himself necessarily. And then also to oversee sort of meetings of, of uh, underneath him, to be sort of the chair of meetings. He does not have the right to simply arbitrarily impose his will on dioceses that are underneath him. So there was a, there was a famous instance in Greece recently where um, a certain we might say louder bishop, had said things uh, uh, against sort of, we'll say, the ecumenical movement generally, had said a few things. This really set off a certain patriarch, and the patriarch took it on himself to try to intervene in the affairs of the Church of Greece and have this bishop disciplined. When that happened, the Archbishop of Greece very rightfully stood up and said, I am the bishop of this diocese. You have no right to come into my diocese and interfere in the affairs of my church. And rightfully, the patriarch had to cease from what he was undertaking. Um, so he can just act arbitrarily. There's very particular parameters into how he, how he sort of interacts. Uh, it's not a papal situation where he has the right to come in and sort of dictate how things are going other places. A diocese is a diocese and it's run by its bishop. Unless there's some extreme situation where there needs to be some over um, some intervention, then the patriarch does not have the right to just step in and, and dictate things within that diocese. That is the local bishop's duty. Um, so I said uh, the task of the, the higher level bishops are administrative. They're to ensure that the church runs in a healthy manner, in an orderly manner. But they, it's not an opportunity for them to sort of control large swaths of, of uh, congregations. Now, in terms of missionary work, um, with respect to the ecumenical patriarch, because I read an article 
by uh, by the patriarch of um, the former patriarch of Russia, Alexei II. Yeah. And where he was commenting on the ecumenical patriarch's misinterpretation of Canon 28. Yeah. Saying, saying that he's in charge of North America. The lands, yes. And that it belongs to him. Yeah. Um, could you briefly comment on that? Or? Yeah, there's, there's not that much to comment on other than the, the ecumenical patriarch for a long period of time has um, argued that it's, it's prerogative to uh, oversee missions in barbarian lands, i.e. lands that aren't autocephalous Orthodox churches. So North America, Britain, Eastern or Western Europe, things like that. Um, so it claims the right to sort of uh, administer those areas. Uh, none of the other churches essentially agree with that. Uh, uh, they don't interpretation, and so they, they don't abide by it. That's it, Father. I, um, okay. I think you've covered lots of ground. <laughs> Sorry, but sometimes my um, my uh, no 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 because uh, I work in law, so <laughs> and I'm in the process of trying to become a lawyer. So no. sometimes I forget and I start acting like a lawyer instead of <laughs> forget. We all, we all have our we all have our areas. Yes, yeah, those, those are good questions. Good questions. I have, uh, if 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 perhaps I have a scripture uh, verse that I was uh, reading on Sunday. If 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 you feel like commenting, uh, unless. Uh, why don't we Why don't we put that one off? Because I'm sort of running okay. out of time now. Okay. okay. Uh, but uh, but keep it in mind for next time, maybe, and we'll we'll look at it. Okay. I I I can email you the question. And then we can sure. It doesn't matter. Or we can talk about it. Whichever. Okay. If it's something that you think is profitable for everyone, we can look at it next time. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Okay. We'll be seeing Christ is risen, and then call our names. Christ is risen from the dead. By death hath he trampled down death, and on those in the tombs he hath bestowed life. Christ is risen. Truly is risen. Thank you very much, Father. We'll talk to you later. Yeah.